Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Lated community conversation on the health crisis in WH. How do you share all the resources and personnel? That's a great question, and I was directing to the Thinking outside the box, trying to come up with new ways of moving. As you already mentioned, the city is so good in the field resource. Let's try to keep these numbers from double. Are there any status? First, I want to say thank you for inviting me to the show. Hello, everybody. It's Mayor Eric Pappenfuss. Thanks for joining us again. It must be Friday at noon because we're on Facebook Live with a community conversation. And today's topic is health, your health and safety in the city of Harrisburg. And we're going to be joined by two very special guests, Ms. Nelva Wright, who is our health officer for the city, and uh, Chief Brian Enterline, who runs our fire department. And will give us uh, some updates on Fire Safety Month, as well as how we continue to respond to the pandemic. But before we get started, I want to begin with a few general announcements. And we'll get the serious one out of the way first. That is, um, just received uh, today the latest uh, BioBot data regarding uh, the city's uh, wastewater. And the uh, data shows that the spread of uh, coronavirus continues in Harrisburg. Um, they graph this on a chart, and uh, you hear the term spike because literally we're beginning to see that uh, chart uh, spike upwards. We are currently back now from a, a wastewater epidemiology standpoint back to where we were uh, sometime at the beginning of July. Uh, back, uh, back, back this summer. It's worse than it's been in August and September and all of October to this date. To put it in perspective, they not only do um, a, a chart which uh, shows the spike, they also show how our virus concentration measures against the hundreds of other wastewater facilities that, uh, that they measure throughout the country. And um, our sample had a higher concentration level than 86% of all the others, which puts Harrisburg off the chart, really, in terms of uh, the standard concentration. So we're seeing a spike. It's much worse than we're seeing elsewhere in hundreds of other uh, uh, treatment centers. And they estimate, based on the wastewater, that the incidence rate is now up to about 35 new cases of coronavirus being contracted each day in the city of Harrisburg metropolitan area. So. It's serious news. Um, I don't want to be overly alarmist about it, but we want to realize that now that we're in cold and flu season, things are getting worse, not better, and we need to continue to take the precautions that we've we've been taking: wearing a mask, washing hands, social distancing. Now is not the time uh, to think we're we're through the woods with regard to coronavirus. So that is the latest data from BioBot, and I want to thank CRW for our continuing partnership there. It's usually predictive of the number of test results that we're seeing uh, in the county uh, as a whole, and we've begun to really see those creep, creep upwards. So I am concerned, and I want everybody uh, to pay close attention and to continue to be as safe as possible in all that we do. And that is the context for uh, why it is that we have canceled uh, trick-or-treat night for the city of Harrisburg. We're not doing traditional trick-or-treat per CDC guidelines because we just don't want to risk the health, especially of our, of our children and our families, uh, by doing a door-to-door -door traditional trick-or-treat treat in which kids are bunched together, um, taking candy potentially from the same sources. So what we're doing in the city of Harrisburg is that uh, the Thursday before Halloween coming up, and it's actually Thursday 1029, we're going to be doing a grab and grow, go treat night. And it's going to be from 5 to 7 at uh, all three of our fire stations, the one on 6th Street, the one on 16th Street, and the one on South 13th Street. Now, Moment's got some footage there, and if you've ever wondered what 2,000 pounds of candy looks like, well, there it is. Um, I want to thank all of our volunteers at uh, City Hall. We had help from our HR department, our events team, uh, the mayor's office, city council. Uh, everybody came together, and we have packed... 3,000 bags of candy, each with, um, uh, with, a, with a couple great handfuls of uh, chocolate and other types of uh, treats to give out at each of the fire stations. Again, from 5 to 7, coming up Thursday, 1029. I hope everyone can make it out, and we're going to have a safe and enjoyable time. We're going to have uh, signs posted for entrance and exit. We're going to have cones so that people are socially distant. We encourage everyone, to young and old, to come in costume and wear a mask. Now, the scarier, the better. And we're going to have a safe and fun 
uh, Grab and Go Treat Night. So again, thanks to all the volunteers and thanks to the companies that came together and helped us. Hershey literally uh, donated a pallet of chocolate, including glow in the dark treats. That was wonderful. Giant kicked in uh, a tremendous amount of candy as well. Uh, the Downtown Improvement District was there, and Wegmans as well has donated candy to the event. All of those sponsors are making it possible for us to have um, uh, thousands. So we've got 3,000 bags, at least uh, a couple handfuls per. You can imagine that's uh, 40, 50,000 pieces of candy that we're going to be distributing throughout Harrisburg. And I know that's a little ironic because we're about to be talking to our, our health officer, Ms. Nelva Wright, but she wanted everyone to know she's giving a special dispensation for uh, Halloween night. Um, it's only once a year, and we can, we can celebrate together, and we can do so safely. In terms of other announcements, um, I wanted to remind folks that leaf pickup is obviously very much ongoing. We need to get those leaf pick leaves picked up, and you uh, once again put your leaves out on street cleaning days uh, right where they plan to come by with the street sweepers. You do not put your leaves or your yard waste out with your trash. It does not go to the incinerator. Uh, your leaves and your yard waste get composted. It's a different crew that comes and picks them up. And we ask that you take your leaves and you bag them if you can and come in compostable brown paper bags, leaf bags that are designed for that. We then take them over to the composting fa uh, facility in Swidera Township and uh, they are turned into compost, which is good for the environment. So please remember to put your leaves out on street cleaning day. The street sweepers follow the city and uh, we pick up the leaves first and the street sweepers come on in. If you uh, have a vehicle, please remember to move it for street sweeping, especially during leaf season, since we're also picking up leaves at this time. We've got to get the cars off the street for those street sweeping times, and you will be ticketed. You may have seen that um, City Council recently approved a new parking enforcement officer for the City of Harrisburg, and that was partly so that we could address uh, the street sweeping issues which are required both for the environment and our own internal operations throughout the City of Harrisburg. I met with our parking enforcement team. Uh, it's, a, it's a good group of, of uh, people, and they are interested in trying to make it work for everybody. So move your cars, put your leaves out on street sweeping nights in whatever your neighborhood and whichever day that may be. And then finally, uh, much talk has been made uh, recently about uh, our new program to remove trees for low-income individuals throughout the city of Harrisburg. We know there's great demand for this. There are trees which people simply can't afford uh, to remove. They may be part of their property or their responsibility, but uh, we as a city are going to try and help. And we are helping by making uh, a tree removal service available on a first-come, first-served basis to um, to the residents of Harrisburg. You do have to qualify by meeting certain income guidelines, but that's it. As long as, uh, as long as you're not independently wealthy and you need our help in removing those trees, you can apply and hopefully will be selected to have your trees removed. The way to do so is to go to harrisburgpa.gov slash trees. And there you can see uh, the letter and the application and the other information that you need from our Parks Maintenance Division. Um, it's very straightforward uh, to fill out, and I know I've had a lot of questions from individuals. When's this going to start? When's it going to start? Well, it's starting now, and we want to remove as many trees as we can uh, between now and the end of the year, especially while the weather holds up. So um, go to harrisburgpa.gov slash trees. And that's all the announcements today. We're going to begin our conversation with a pre-recorded uh, section that we did with the city's health uh, officer, Nelva Wright, yesterday. Nelva uh, had to be in the field today, so couldn't join us live in the studio. But a good conversation about a new grant, uh, which the health office has received. And we're going to talk a little bit about the vision of the health office as we move forward. Then we're going to come back live with... Uh, Fire Chief Brian Enterline, and we'll talk about Fire Safety Month. So we'll see you in just a few minutes. Our first guest today is Ms. Nelva Wright, who is the health officer for the city of Harrisburg. Welcome, Nelva. Thank you for joining us in studio. Um, wanted to talk a little bit, first of all, about what the health officer for the city of Harrisburg does, and um, uh, who better to, uh, to talk to the public about it than you? 
Well, thank you for having me, Mr. Mayor, and I really appreciate it. And the health office is part of the code department. Mm -hmm. So it's um, a, an arm of the code department that's designed to basically protect the health of Harrisburg residents. That's a big thing. Um, right now, the main focus for the health office is really talking about food safety. So my primary responsibility is to work with our business community that, that have food establishments, whether they be restaurants, working with the schools, churches, mobile food, you know, some of our food trucks that come to the city, and just basically doing a relatively thorough inspection of their facility. So I'll be looking at things like how they're storing their food, where they're getting their food they're serving to the customers, um, the cleanliness of the facility. Are there any things, you know, structurally going on? And that's why kind of like how we tie in with code to make sure the building is, is safe, is safe um, and, and the equipment is safe within the restaurant or the other, you know, food establishment. And just kind of going through a checklist. So if someone is going to have a food establishment here in Harrisburg, they would initially go get their business business license and they would apply for it and we may ask for drawings if it's an existing restaurant already we would kind of take into account what's already there but we would look at you know their refrigeration we look at their stoves we look at how they would be storing their food and making sure that everything is compliant with the standards so um, the food code it was through the Department of Agriculture here in Pennsylvania. So I follow the standards of the food code, and it's actually an FDA federal food code as well. And they pretty much mirror each other. So there's basically a checklist that I would go through when I get to an establishment. I, you know, introduce myself, of course, and we'd sit down and we'd talk about the menu, because there may be a restaurant that has a specialized menu. So someone who's serving sushi would be a little different than someone who's serving a hamburger or a hot dog. So it's all about just building that rapport, finding out what the goals and the you know, aspirations are for the establishment, and for us to be a partner in making sure that the establishment is doing everything they can to avoid any type of foodborne illness, which is a very serious situation. You know, there are 43 million people in the United States who get sick every year from foodborne illness and it could be because it wasn't stored properly or something contaminated it there's a lot of reasons 128,000 people every year are hospitalized because of foodborne illness and 3,000 die so it's very important for us to, as we grow as a city as we continue to build with our community that we are on top of things so I'm one person in the mm -hmm. office at this point so it's a little difficult you know for me to try to get to everyone and i've heard from a lot of our our you know our business owners you know come out and see me you know and, and make sure we get here so it, it's always been a little bit of a challenge for our office that has been traditionally a one-person show so um i do have partnerships with department of agriculture they come in and they kind of support with training and they try to do a lot of things to kind of help us you know get where our office needs to be. So I'm looking forward to moving along and, and getting some more, you know, opportunities to, for growth. But uh, the main goal is to make sure everyone is getting food and, and it is safe. Absolutely. And I, I know you have a, uh, a good working relationship with all the restaurants uh, in, in our city. And this is a particularly difficult time to be uh, in the restaurant industry. Uh, as you know, um, many of the restaurants are, are, are having trouble with the limited capacity amidst uh, the COVID restrictions. Um, some uh, of our longtime residents in the city have, have already gone out of business and perhaps uh, even more uh, may as, uh, as, as this surge potentially progresses into the winter months. Um, can you talk a little bit about how the challenges of the pandemic have uh, has affected your job and maybe these personal relationships with these restaurateurs that you see day in and day out? You're absolutely right. I mean, one of the things that have been it has been most difficult is some of the people that I have developed the relationships in this business community from the food establishment. I, I've seen these people and I won't see many of them again. And that is very difficult because it's a hard business. You know, owning a food establishment, a lot of times it's a family business, a lot of times it's a long standing business. It's hard work day after day, you know, night after night. And it's, it's really been very difficult, you know, and I've really tried to, um, give out as much information, you know, as we had the red, the green, the yellow, you know, that that was a very 
difficult transition for a lot of our business owners here in town. And as we move forward, you know, I am encouraging the, the business owners and the restaurants that are here to please register with the state, you know, so they can get to that 50% capacity and at least try to maintain, um, you know, some money coming in and maintain some viability. I have seen a lot of innovation which is, says something mm -hmm. about how resilient our business community is. Uh, a lot of our restaurants are now, you know, setting up their tents and they're doing a lot of things with the heated lamps and they're, and they're providing, you know, alternatives outside. So I'm very supportive of when a restaurant wants to do that. And some restaurants have actually got food trailers and are going through communities. So I've really noticed um, a real passion for success and, and kind of overcoming the challenges whenever possible. But regardless, you know, it has been a very difficult time to own any business but the food business in particular because they, they rely on, on us to be there so much yeah it's hard and to, to the extent that uh, people's eating habits are just uh, changing it's going more towards takeout it's a takeout many resident or many restaurants I don't think were were necessarily set up for that to begin with and they've had to change their business models and plans um, I know your focus is on you know foodborne illness and the health and safety of restaurant established generally but has it changed a bit during the pandemic so that you're uh, you're giving advice and trying to help uh, restaurants deal with the uh, uh, with COVID and the uh, and the capacity issues and social distancing and basically how to run uh, a, a restaurant amidst a, a whole new uh, series of health challenges. You're absolutely right, Mr. Mayor. It is a new normal, no doubt. And a, a lot of questions that I get in my office, you know, a lot of emails I get is exactly what should I be doing? Um, yeah, it has taken a no, whole nother direction for our office because we're looking looking at things like pathogens and we're looking at, you know, um, habits as far as hand washing. I mean, these things were always on the, you know, front of the you know list of things to take care of. But it's a different kind of connotation now because it's more intense than ever. You know, it's not something that can be kind of looked at on a, on a, a 3,000 foot level, you know, 30,000 foot level. It really has become very, very close to home and, and people are looking for guidance. So our office has expanded into looking at, you know, um, illness in, regard, in a greater um, breadth, if you will, looking at infection, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to just foodborne and, you know, illness and infection, but also infection overall, because now we're looking at respiratory, you know, infections, et cetera. So it has changed quite a bit. Sure, sure. And uh, and you mentioned how different restaurants and uh, are, are adapting uh, to, to change. And we've seen a lot of that. We we had a very successful stint with the outdoor dining. I know that um, certain restaurants are, are going to try and continue that for as, as long as the weather can permit. I even was sent an article about how in other cities uh, uh, they, they, they've had igloos set up for <laughs> outdoor uh, dining uh, with heaters and everything. So. Um, uh, what what are your thoughts on uh, do, do you have any general advice for uh, for the winter months and, and and for restaurants as as we we try and make it through to the spring? I would say continue to be as innovative as possible. Um, we are in the Northeast. I mean, Pennsylvania will have its you know climate change and everything, um, but like I said, people are becoming more and more innovative with their own ideas. So I would suggest if any restaurant is out there that's thinking of something new, thinking of something novel, by all means reach out to the health office and we'll look at it. You know, I've, I've again, I've just seen so many people trying different things now to just adapt to this new normal. So I'm open to whatever, you know, people are thinking right now because it needs to be evaluated because this may not be a short term situation. So I would love to see more people just coming out and, and trying new things and, and being innovative. I welcome that and I will work with them in any way possible to make it happen. That's great to know. And the best way to reach you is what? I can be reached through the code department. My direct number is 717-255-6563. Uh, we do have a, a spot on the website. I will be doing more with uh, social media as we move forward. Now that the dynamic has changed, I may not be able to see people in person mm -hmm. as much as I'd like. So I'm going to be offering a lot more training, a lot more interaction and opportunities to reach us through uh, the website and through social media. But right now, the best way to reach me is 717 255 6563.
Mm, great. Thank you, Nelba. And I, I have to say, uh, we have to do our part as residents in the city to try and help uh, help these businesses survive. We've uh, had a number of promotions over the course of, of the fall, including Shop Local, and uh, we, we've got to try and keep it up because the winter is going to be difficult. I saw Dauphin County just released uh, a, a list of businesses that were awarded uh, CARES Act funding through the county, included a number of uh, Harrisburg restaurants. I was glad to see that. I know that the city is working on a second round of uh, of, of funding, CDBG funding that can go to um, uh, uh, to, to small businesses, but it's going to be it's going to be a difficult time. However, I will say we got some very good news just recently, which is um, that uh, the city of Harrisburg, through your efforts, was was awarded a grant, a significant grant from the Food and Drug Administration. It's called the Retail Standards Grant, and it can be used by your office to enhance operations. So let's talk about this grant. Um, what does it What does it mean for you, and what does it mean for the residents of our city? Well, the Retail Standards Grant, uh, it's really a, a really big deal. And I'll just give a little history about yeah. what retail standards are. Um, when we talk about food and borne illness, again, I gave some of the statistics of how many millions are affected. Uh, we look at the CDC, the FDA, all these organizations have come together to try to standardize, if you will, how inspections are done. Traditionally, an office like myself would be different than an office in Lancaster, it would be different than an office in Philadelphia. So the universal approach to managing foodborne illness, illness and preventing foodborne illness was kind of hopscotch. You know, everyone had their own standards, everyone's doing their own thing. So about 18 years ago, actually, the CDC, the FDA, and a couple other agencies got together and said, we need to standardize this process. If we're going to reduce the uh, numbers of foodborne illnesses and the risk thereof, then we need to figure out how is everyone talking to each other? How are we doing this in a universal fashion? So the retail standards was born from that effort. Mm -hmm. And now, believe it or not, over these 18 years, they've actually have come up with nine standards, which are basically like benchmarks. And you try to reach the benchmarks. You know, each municipality will have to do a self-assessment, which we did last year. And then just kind of say, where are we today? And how are we doing? And from there, you kind of pick out, you know, where the areas are you strong, where the areas are you weak, and you build upon that. And the goal is to reach the, the nine standards. So um, we've, did, we've done that here in this office. And, uh, you know, we've met some. You know, there's some we're still working on. And so the part of the retail standards grant is to help bring targeted municipalities. It's a competitive process. Mm -hmm. But they look at targeted municipalities and say, okay, who can we, who do we see on the brink of, of getting some things done around here and how can we help? So Harrisburg being kind of like a one-man show, they really felt that for, for our particular area, with the population that we have and the amount of growth that we have been seeing, they felt that it would be a great in investment into Harrisburg to try to help us build capacity, try to help us do a little more with technology. Um, our office is actually doing pretty well in far, as far as how we're reporting and how universal we are because we're so close to Department of Ag. So we have some advantage, you know, because of our location. But there's still some challenges in regards to our headcount. There's actually standards we can't meet because we don't have enough people, or we don't have the technology to actually meet the standards. So they're like, well, you know, we really need to correct that. And that was part of putting us in the, the competitive process, and thus, you know, we were, were selected. So I'm really excited about that. Yeah, that's great. Uh, and as you say, it was a competitive process. So, uh, and, and kudos to you for, for leading the charge and uh, preparing this application and working, uh, fighting for the, these resources to come to Harrisburg. So it's going to mean greater capacity for your office. Talk about um, what you will be able to do now with, uh, with the proceeds from the grant. Good question. I, I'm so excited. We'll be able to increase the amount of outreach is one of the things that we were strong in and we need to be even stronger. So um, looking at novel ideas as far as food safety training is a big thing for all of us across the country. So I'm hoping to in increase the number of courses that are allowed and that are available to our managers. And this uh, Serve Safe and you have Food Safety. You have several organizations that are offering uh, a lot of training. Um, I'd like to you know, increase that training to include some training in other languages, maybe a, some mm -hmm. Spanish courses, um, just increase the availability, whether it be remotely now, we can probably do more in those regards. And also just coming up with materials and references 
So uh, a survey is one of the things we like to do with some of our restaurants to find out how is COVID, you know, post COVID, if you will, or, mm -hmm. or into COVID. Um, how are you doing? What kinds of support would be good for you? You know, as they're trying to come up with novel ideas to deal with, you know, what's going on, how can we support you in those areas? So I'm encouraging restaurant owners and other owners of food entities to reach out, again, with your ideas, with some of the things that you're trying to do. Um, and we can do some of that research. We can come up with some, maybe some materials, you know, printed materials or, or social media materials that will help with not only the training, but also help some of the owners kind of reach you know, out to their staff and help their staff improve. And, and whether it's right now or whether when they hopefully restaff and get back up to speed, they'll have a contingent of people that are properly trained, that already know the uniqueness of their business and can kind of hit the run, hit the ground running when I hope this whole thing, you know, changes for the better. That's right. We've got to prepare for a post-COVID uh, restaurant scene and a time. We know that's coming. It may it may be months away, but it's uh, it's definitely coming again. And one of the things about Harrisburg, which has always impressed me, has been the 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 real diversity of culinary options. I mean, our our restaurants here are 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 you know world class and uh, incredibly diverse, and they are uh, they're resilient, and and we're gonna we're gonna rebuild them uh, even uh, even after we make it to the other side of this this pandemic. There's an, another aspect though of of the city, which is that we um, we live in 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 various neighborhoods in various parts of the city. We have food deserts, or we have areas where we don't have access to. Um, healthy eating options. And uh, I know you've actively been uh, trying to remedy that situation too. Can you talk a little bit about your efforts to eradicate food deserts in Harrisburg? Absolutely. And that is another area uh, that I take a personal interest in. Um, you're absolutely right. I mean, I'm a resident of Uptown and, you know, we always talk about that at community meetings and in various, you know, sections of the city, as you mentioned. Um, I know there's a number of initiatives that are going on. There's the greenhouse. There's a number of things mm -hmm. that are going on. And my hope is that we will continue. I've always tried to partner within those projects that are going on. Uh, but I'd like to, as our department increases capacity and ability to do more, to kind of expand the role of the health office. I mean, traditionally, again, it's been all about food illness, food borne illness, right. but I'd like to look into things that deal with chronic disease. I mean, a health office, you know, there's so many aspects to health. We have a very large population who have underlying conditions, you know, obesity, heart disease, um, high blood pressure, you know, et cetera. So we need to take a more active role. My vision would be to do more. You know, I've done a few things, you know, one-offs, you know, with some infectious disease specialists and some things here and there, but I'd really like to see our office become even more proactive in healthy food, healthy communities, and also just general overall health and, and taking some of that initiative and doing more in those areas. So I look forward to, to participating more in what's going on already, you know, with some of the initiatives, you know, with, um, you know, like I said, the greenhouse and some other things that are going on, you know, urban farming, but also to, to kind of spearhead some things out of the health office to support that. That's great. And this grant that we're talking about, it's going to it's going to allow you to grow. It's going to allow you to do things like uh, build the capacity, update databases, um, have uh, greater mobile accessibility, and um, increase really the technology of the office. So we're, we're excited about that. We're excited about what the future holds for the health office. Um, since you're here, one, one final question. I uh, want, to, want to talk a little bit about the holiday season, which, believe it or not, is almost upon us. I got my flu shot uh, uh, yesterday, yes. and I encourage everybody to get their flu shot. But I was a little traumatized because as I was walking down the aisles of Rite Aid to get my flu shot, I saw all the Christmas decorations up. So we know that uh, the holiday season's upon us. And maybe you've got some tips for, uh, for folks, both in terms of uh, just general health and wellness tips, like getting a flu shot, but also um, ways to uh, you know, help uh, uh, prepare holiday meals safely. Yes, and I definitely don't want to be the Grinch. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we are very excited. I mean, this is the holiday season. It is a time of celebration. You know, and this year is obviously different than previous years. Um, as far as food safety is concerned, of course, we always talk about, you know, keeping your, if you're going to be cooking, to keep the food temperatures, you know, where they need to be, and cooking to, you know, the, the for example, for chicken, 165, you know, you can always look at those guidelines on our website. But the main thing is going to be personal safety you know this year so 
while you're celebrating, you know, a lot of the, the CDC, I'm sure you can go online and just see all the, the suggestions that are being made. Obviously, if you're going to be cooking and serving people, you want to have the social distancing in place. You want to be able to have your guests, but they need to have masks. You know, you want to have everyone washing their hands and just being responsible you know if some people are not doing anything at all you know but if you are please take those extra precautions make sure that you know utensils are not being shared improperly you know it's just different things that need to be a second look needs to be taken you know because we're family we're all used to kind of doing things a certain way and not being so you know aware of if we're too close or you know if someone's you know not feeling well if someone's not feeling well then maybe they can't come this year you know so it's just a little difficult to um, make some of those hard choices but the holidays is a time of celebration but it's also a time for safety so take care of the food that you're cooking but more importantly take care of your guests take care of the family and make sure that you're doing everything you can do to be safe it's good advice, uh, very good advice. You know, we're, we're, we, um, I think we're all craving the connections of family Absolutely. and uh, we all want to be uh, to the other side of this pandemic, but we're not there yet and we have, to, um, we have to continue to take sensible precautions and there are ways to get together and to do it safely and we just have to uh, focus on that. So thanks for your message and we'll continue to put out uh, information from your office to the public on a, on a regular basis. Thanks, thanks for the updates today, Nelva. Thank you, thank you for having me. And again, if anyone has any questions, I can be reached at 717-255-6563. And have a wonderful holiday, everyone. All right, we are back live and we are joined over Zoom by our fire chief, Brian Enderline. And we're going to talk a little bit about fire safety month, which is upon us. Uh, you know, we just, uh, well, first, uh, Chief, I want to say thank you for assisting in our grabbing uh, go treat night, uh, which we're going to be doing this Thursday at each of the fire stations. Appreciate the fact that um, uh, the fire department is opening its stations and helping us uh, social distance and making sure that it's going to be a, a safe and great event. We're going to be giving the candy out in bags that have some fire safety tips. And uh, I think that's, uh, that's important to note. And it's also important to note that while we're we're sort of watching what we're eating this uh, this Halloween season, we also need to to, to watch how we're preparing that food. And uh, uh, as uh, Nelva just finished the conversation, saying we're going to be having a lot of people gathering for holidays and meal preparation. And so let's start there. Um, I understand that one of the leading causes of fire in Harrisburg is unattended cooking. Is that the case? And if so, what are some good advice? Yeah, well, uh, good afternoon, Mayor. Um, we have uh, always seen a, a significant number of uh, unattended cooking fires in Harrisburg, um, and, and for various reasons. Uh, and uh, it's something that plagues not only Harrisburg, it, it plagues the nation, uh, and is one of the leading causes of death um, due to fire uh, throughout the United States. When we look at statistics uh, from uh, NFPA and uh, the United States Fire Administration, uh, we, we see that it is a, a plaguing issue for us. Uh, you know, the easiest thing to do and, and, and the biggest message that we have is just watch what you're cooking. Um, so a lot of times what ends up happening, uh, especially here in Harrisburg, we see we'll put some food on the stove and uh, we'll walk away from it. And you know, what happens when we walk away from our food? We, we go in, we, we, you know, we grab our cell phones, we're sitting on the couch watching the video and uh, all of a sudden we forget, you know, we totally forget about the food. And the next thing you know, the, the, uh, the pot, the pan uh, has boiled over with grease in it. Uh, you know, it's on fire uh, and it, it's getting up into the, into the cabinets and, and, you know, burning the kitchens out. So uh, the biggest thing, um, the, the biggest, biggest thing that we can say is please just watch what you're heating. Um, we are getting ready to, uh, even in our, in our elderly high rises that we have uh, throughout the city, um, trying to protect those folks a little bit more. Um, we're going to be handing out some uh, fire prevention uh, material for them because we see a lot of fire alarms. Now, those buildings are, are, you know, fortunate. They all have fire alarms. And I, I can't for, unfortunately say that our, our residents all have smoke alarms in. Uh, and we'll discuss a, a little bit about the free smoke alarms in, in a bit. But uh, so the one of the issues that we have in our elderly high rises is a, a plaguing number of uh, fire alarms due to unattended cooking. So we're going to be handing out some uh, great cooking uh, items for, for our uh, folks living in, in high rises. 
so it kind of gives them a little, uh, uh, you know, focus on that they should be watching what they're heating, some oven mitts and, and some fire safety literature and, and some uh, things like that that will help them hopefully to um, remember to watch what they're heating. Well, very good advice. Uh, I, I know if your house is like mine, and I know uh, houses throughout Harrisburg, especially with uh, kids being home from school and learning remotely, uh, people working from home and telecommuting, we are we are using more power than uh, ever ever before. I, I I know I had to search for outlets that I didn't even know I had in certain rooms uh, to uh, plug in all the de devices and make sure people have room for um, uh, spreading out and conducting business in school. So, um, what are some good tips that uh, people can keep in mind uh, regarding uh, sort of device and uh, appliance safety? We see a lot of issues um, here in Harrisburg with, um, we call them zip strips, so multi-unit adapters, and, and I'll show some photos here in a little bit. Uh, so we got to be very careful with those. Our electrical systems, and you know, when we look around Harrisburg, our housing stock is older. Uh, and so that means the electrical systems are older, and they're, they're not designed, or we're not designed, engineered for the electrical load that we're, you know, that we're putting on them with modern day technology, you know, you know with uh, not just one computer, but now, you know, if there's four or five of us in a family, all four or five of us have a computer, we have a cell phone. Uh, so, so that demand on an electrical system is significant. Uh, those uh, multi-unit uh, adapters uh, are, are meant to, uh, you know, take small loads, uh, you know, a couple cell phone chargers, things like that, maybe a computer and a monitor, uh, and put into one outlet. However, what we see happening is uh, we'll have uh, folks plug in a refrigerator, a, a, a space heater, uh, maybe a refrigerator and a space heater, and then a the computer and, and, and a whole bunch of other things, and they short out very quickly. Um, that, that demand coming through that wire um, is, is, is too great uh, for what the wiring was designed for inside of them, and it starts to break down. Uh, we have a, a small arc, uh, and then we have a fire. And typically, these things, you know, we don't want them laying in the middle of the room, and and we kind of hide them. So we put them behind furniture or under furniture. Uh, and as soon as that that spark and that that small smoldering fire starts to happen, it catches those chairs and and couches and beds on fire. And that those are the largest fuel sources that we quite frankly have in our homes nowadays. So it it creates a, a fairly large fire in in a short order of time. Yeah, there's got to be some statistics uh, out there. I'll try and find them for people and share them regarding uh, increased uh, electrical usage now that uh, everybody is home and working from home. And it's uh, it's just good general advice to keep in mind not to over overload those uh, adapters. We're you know we're it's starting to get colder. Um, we're we're moving into winter, and the uh, the issue is going to arise specifically about space heaters. Can you talk a little bit about the do's and don'ts of space heaters? And, and I think, uh, you know, the winter season's coming. Um, you know, unfortunately, we still have a lot of people out of work. So um, energy bills are one of those things that, uh, uh, you know, become an issue for folks to afford. And, uh, you know, so maybe we can't afford to put oil in the tank and we start to rely on space heaters, um, which is obviously not recommended, uh, you know, by the fire department. Um, but if you if you do need uh, you know find yourself in need of using a space heater, um, a couple of a couple of things. Number one, um, make sure that you're using a current unit, one that's um, UL listed, uh, has a little underwriters laboratory sticker on it. Um, you don't want to be using a, a space heater from the 1960s or 70s, uh, or even the 1980s. They're just uh, those units. You know, they heat up, they they cool down, they heat up, they cool down, and it breaks uh, it breaks all the wiring inside of those things down over time. Um, so we, we want to uh, make sure we have a newer unit. Uh, we want to make sure that that unit is plugged directly into the wall socket. So again, going back to um, those, those multi-unit adapters, zip strips, um, we don't want to plug that uh, space heater into those zip strips. They're not designed for that type of load uh, on uh, on them, so we want to plug it directly into the outlet uh, in the uh, in the wall, the wall outlet. So we don't want to use an extension cord. We don't want to uh, use zip strips right into the wall for for any space heater that we may need to use. And the other and, and a very important fact that last year we had multiple fires with space heaters, uh, and and the majority of them, and I, I would say uh, ninety percent of them. Uh, were a result, they were too close to combustible materials. So we don't want that space heater right next to the bed or right next to the chair. 
uh, we want to keep that three foot away from anything that may be flammable. So th that includes uh, things such as the curtains in our, in our living rooms or dining rooms. So we want to keep that three feet away from those. As those curtains move, they, they, have, they have the potential to come in contact um, with that space heater. We also want to keep them away from our bed, uh, from you know, the, uh, the couch, the chair, uh, anything that could potentially burn. Keep that three foot space, clear space the whole way around those. Uh, and another, and you know, another uh, issue that that we don't see a lot of here in Harrisburg, but we also want to make sure that our, our children are protected from them. And you know, e even the little ones, um, you know, make sure that we early on um, do some positive reinforcement that 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 space heater is not a toy, and they shouldn't be, you know, they shouldn't be trying to touch it or put their toys into it. Um, over the years, we've seen a couple of fires where. Um, young kids, um, you know, take their, their toys and want to put them in there, and th then we have a small fire. So um, there, there's a lot more information, uh, you know, if you want to talk about it as a family, um, going on to the sparky.org uh, website, which is uh, hosted by the National Fire Protection Association. Lots of great information on there for, for families, some things very specific to um, space heater um, safety and use as well. Great, thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that uh, citation, and we'll we'll check that out. Now, recently in the city of Harrisburg, we had a um, a pretty devastating fire on Paxton Street, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit about what happened there and what lessons uh, the public might take from that. Sure, um, we we had a, a very unfortunate uh, uh, fire on Paxton Street uh, last weekend, uh, and it was a result of um, careless use of smoking materials. And we, we had seen a decrease uh, nationwide with smoking material fires when, when uh, you know, kitchen fires really took over. But we're, we're seeing a little bit of a spike again in, uh, un, in, in improper use of smoking materials. So uh, if, if we're smoking, a couple of things that, that uh, you know, we want you to do um, from a health perspective, uh, obviously our job is to tell you you shouldn't be smoking. It's bad for you. But we know that uh, we all have our lights and you want to smoke. That's... that's uh, you know, uh, a personal choice that you, that you must make. But if you're going to make that personal choice and smoke, uh, make sure that you're using, uh, you know, large, deep ashtrays. Uh, make sure that they're, they're put on, uh, you know, an end table or a, a table, not slid underneath of a couch, um, not rested on the arm of the, uh, of, of the recliner, uh, not sitting on, on the recliner or the couch or the love seat. Um, so that these things, um, you know, when you're smoking, so that, uh, you know, they don't end up tipping over accidentally. One thing that is very unique about a cigarette fire, unlike a kitchen fire that, uh, you know, once that oil takes off and starts burning, it's a rapid fire. The small smoldering um, uh, hot end of that cigarette can burrow itself down into a couch. And you may not see any smoke because it actually crusts itself over uh, as, as it burns into that. And you'll think, oh, look, it, it, it's out. There's, there's some... Uh, uh, carbonaceous char over top of it, uh, and we're good. There's there's nothing going on here. Unfortunately, that cigarette continues to burrow itself down into that uh, in, into that couch cushion or love seat cushion, and at the you know maybe an hour, two hours, three hours later, uh, it gets enough of energy inside of there uh, and and starts to smolder, and that's when a fire erupts. And that's essentially what we had happen on Paxton Street. Um, the uh, the resident was smoking in, in an overstuffed chair. Uh, the uh, the cigarette ash got onto the chair about two and a half hour, two two and a half hours later is uh, when uh, when the fire broke out. And at, at that point, um, the, the resident tried to put the fire out. And one of the things that we always recommend uh, is calling nine one one first. Uh, we understand trying to put the fire out, but we need to get that help on the street right away. Uh, and because of them trying to put the fire out, we had uh, two residents actually taken to the hospital for smoke inhalation who just barely made it out of the house because they were trying to put the fire out. So, um, you know, big, uh, you know, big thing, call 911 for us, uh, get us started. Uh, and if you can safely use a fire extinguisher or safely, uh, you know, use your garden hose to, to try and hold that fire and check until we get there, that's fine. But you got to be able to do it safely and from outside the building. Wow. You know, it occurred to me while you were talking that we've uh, done such a good job as uh, a community and in, in terms of getting the public health message out to not smoke that um, 
uh, you just you don't see the the public uh, ashtrays or uh, cigarette dispensers uh, in public places or restaurants or wherever that you used to, and uh, you know it's uh, it's it's important to remind people of the of the safeties of smoking. It's just not as commonplace as it used to be, and in some respects, that makes it even more dangerous. Um, Let's go back to that issue of smoke alarms, those smoke detectors, because uh, that is one area where, um, you know, uh, we have the ability to come and install for free of charge uh, a smoke detector. So um, talk to the public about how they can take advantage of that. Sure. We have been, um, the city of Harrisburg, the, the Bureau of Fire has been install, uh, installing free smoke alarms for many, many years. Those, the smoke alarms have saved countless lives um, and have alerted um, you know, residents to countless fires that we were never called to, um, quite frankly, because when that thing goes off um, and, and you're alerted to the, uh, to the issue, you know, maybe it's that pan of meat on the stove that you forgot about. Um, you're able to go take the pan of meat off the stove um, before it uh, erupts into a, into a fire and we're never called. So the, the, the uh, benefits um, are unbelievable with smoke alarms. And, and the great news is they are free. So if you're in, in the, in the city of Harrisburg and you have old or you have no smoke alarms in your home, if you call our office um, at uh, 717-255-6464, we will send a fire truck out um, with uh, several firefighters on it and we will install the needed fire alarms for you uh, throughout your home. So uh, we recommend, uh, you know, in the bedroom, our, our fire code is very specific. Uh, you got to have one in every bedroom, one outside of the sleeping areas, and one on every floor of the building, including the basement. Um, so we will come out free of charge um, and install those. And the uh, the great news, that the, the uh, money that we had available to us to buy smoke alarms, um, we are now only buying 10-year lithium battery smoke alarms, meaning that it doesn't mean you can put it up and forget about it. We still want you to, uh, to test that smoke alarm once a month and make sure it's working. However, you will not have to worry about a battery and replacing that battery after a year. Um, these uh, smoke alarms that we have have a 10-year uh, lithium battery in, and uh, so they will be worry-free um, from a battery replacement standpoint for 10 years. Yeah, it's amazing yeah. the technological improvements that have been made and the the, the length of uh, some of those batteries. And uh, having been out with you in the fire department and installed uh, smoke detectors in Harrisburg neighborhoods before, uh, it's um, it's important to remind folks that you really do need perhaps more more smoke detectors than you think. You want them uh, staged throughout the house and all the locations that you just mentioned, including the bedrooms. And uh, not, not all houses have the proper coverage. So if you are if you if you want any smoke detectors at all, but you also want to know whether or not your house is properly covered with smoke detectors, call the fire department. And um, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's terrific. I, I want to uh, talk, since we've got you here, just a, a little bit about um, uh, the, the fire department generally. Uh, people may have seen that uh, this past uh, uh, week or two, we, we just swore in a, a new batch of uh, uh, cadets, and uh, we've increased our, our our numbers at the Harrisburg Fire Department dramatically since uh, where we were just a few years ago. So uh, can you talk a little bit about how the department has grown under, under your leadership and uh, visions for where you'd like to be in the future? Sure. Um, yeah, we, we are, uh, you know, extremely proud of uh, where we are um, as far as personnel. Um, we have been able to replace one for one as we've had retirements, um, which is something that, you know, had not been done in the past for a long time. Uh, as a matter of fact, just uh, just today, as, as we discussed, um, we made two uh, tentative job offers uh, to two more firefighter candidates um, that will start the fire academy in January. So it's a fairly long process. But, uh, you know, over the last seven years, we've been able to um, increase our staffing I believe when we, you look back, we were at 68 uh, was the number when uh, when I, I came downtown here. And, uh, you know, we're at 90 now. Uh, actually, 88 will be at 90 with the two new hires. And that is that is a number that we haven't seen in the Bureau of Fire since in the uh, mid-2000s, uh, about t- 2005, 2006. Uh, and, and what that does, it's a huge benefit to the citizens. Um, and to the property owners in the city because when we look at that staffing number um, we're now working with a few more than what the minimum is on a more uh, steady basis in other words we're not backfilling um, with overtime 
and, uh, and, and working with that bare minimum. Having those extra firefighters uh, allows it then when, when some are off on vacation, we still have enough of folks to cover without calling in overtime, number one. So that, that saves significant um, uh, funding on, on one end. And then on, on the, the very positive end for the homeowners uh, and property owners in the city, it puts more firefighters on a daily basis on the fire trucks, which when we look at um, how our operations work, the more folks that we can put on a scene quickly, um, the, 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 the smaller that fire will be kept, the, the quicker that emergency will be dealt with, thus resulting in less property damage uh, and ultimately um, less, uh, you know, less damage and less potential for that, that building fire to um, you, take that building and uh, take it off the tax rolls for us. Uh, in other words, we, we don't burn down as many buildings uh, as what we used to with a, a lower staffing number. Um, it, it also positions us um, uh, very well to look at uh, assisting our uh, partners uh, outside of the city of Harrisburg. So um, we know um, nationwide and, and specifically here in Pennsylvania, there's been a significant decrease in the number of volunteer firefighters. And that, that's for many, many reasons. Uh, and our, uh, our, our partners outside of the city um, are relying 100% on volunteers. And th there's a, a great potential now for us to be able to provide them a service um, where their residents will be protected just like our, uh, our residents here in the city of Harrisburg are. So it positions us well to start negotiating with municipalities that are interested in um, increasing their protection uh, to their citizens and to their infrastructure um, by placing uh, a, a combined career slash volunteer staffing model uh, into their municipalities. Yeah, and that type of intergovernmental cooperation is something that I think we really want to see and something that's important for not only the city's future, but the, the region's future. It wasn't that long ago that uh, all the conversation was about minimum manning and whether or not we could, you know, possibly have enough people to uh, to, to staff the various shifts. And uh, uh, over time, uh, accordingly, was uh, was through the roof, over a million dollars a year. And we've really, uh, we've really cut that back and we've re really rebuilt the, the capacity of the department. I do want to ask you a tough question, though, which has to do with um, diversity in the fire department. And, and I know that's something that uh, is important to you and something that we've been working hard to try uh, and improve on, but uh, there's still ways to go. So what's your approach to, to having uh, a more diverse Harrisburg Fire Department? Uh, yeah, and, and, you know, I look at that. Um, yeah, I think we always got to look at uh, what our strengths and what our weaknesses are. And I think probably one of my biggest failures to the city um, as, as a leader of the fire department is not being able to attract a diverse um, uh, candidate pool. Uh, and, you know, we tried some things uh, with the last testing process um, that uh, quite frankly, just we did not see the results that we were anticipating. Uh, we, uh, we are scheduled to start a, uh, a new civil service testing round uh, next year. Uh, our, our list, because it's a civil service list, is good for two years. Um, our current list expires uh, the end of next year. So uh, our goal is that uh, after the first of the year, um, we're going to start uh, looking heavily at how we can attract um, uh, various minority groups um, and, and you know really bring them into the fire service and show them that this job can be for them. A lot of times what I hear uh, you know, just talking with, with the many people I talk with on the streets uh, on, on, a, on a weekly basis is, now that, that job's not for me. I don't want to do that. It's too dangerous. Or, or I don't have the training, so I can't do the job. And, you know, my response to that, um, you know, has always been, you know, it is a dangerous job, but it's a very rewarding job. Uh, and it doesn't matter that you don't have any experience uh, as a firefighter. Many, many um, firefighters that we've hired over the years uh, and we fired recently, have had no fire experience, um, no fire service experience at all. So they, they come into this not knowing the difference between uh, inch and three quarter and uh, two and a half inch hose, what a truck was, what an engine was, uh, you know, how to properly throw a ladder, how to wear an air pack, uh, those types of things. That's all things that we can teach you. We just need to get you um, to, to take our test and we will teach you everything that you need to know. We will make you a great firefighter um, with zero experience. And uh, we, uh, I think that we, we need um, we need to really reach out into the communities uh, and make that some some one-on-one -on -one interactions. And we had some pretty good success at the high school with that. 
Um, we enacted a, a volunteer firefighter program um, for junior members, um, so ages um, 14 through 18, um, with the West Shore Bureau of Fire back in 2015. And it's been a very successful program. We, we've had uh, some success. Um, three of the three of the um, students that we had involved early on are still involved with the West Shore Bureau of Fire. Um, and I'm hoping that uh, that those three that they're now um, of age to be able to take our, our civil service test, that they'll be taking uh, the civil service test. And, and I will tell you that all of those that have been involved in our junior program have been minorities. Um, and, and it's been a, a great, um, uh, just a, a great thing for them. It's, it was great for the West Shore Bureau of Fire. Uh, and, and I look forward to also working with the school district. Um, unfortunately, COVID hit. Um, we were looking at, at doing some things um, this year in the in the school uh, and, and building a program out. But uh, with COVID, um, we're going to have to postpone that to the 2021 uh, school year. So, you know, hopefully we will be able to, um, you know, reach more folks on a one-on-one basis uh, in the coming year and encourage them, be more encouraging and uh, and maybe having some uh, open houses, um, small gatherings. So maybe six to 10 people at a time and, and really walk them through what it's like to be a firefighter on a, on a real personal level. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe have them in for uh, dinner and, and, you know, get, get to play around with some of the things that, that we play around with uh, on a daily basis with the ladders and the saws and the jaws of life and things like that. And uh, maybe pique that interest um, to bring them into to our, uh, to our job. Yeah, and th yeah, thanks for that. And maybe there's somebody watching uh, this right now on Facebook Live and is thinking to themselves, well, maybe, you know, maybe that, that might be an interesting uh, career choice. What Can you just walk us through the basics of, uh, uh, you, you mentioned a civil service test. Uh, how does one uh, sign up to take that test? What type of uh, background information do you need to know in order to pass the test? And uh, how does the academy work? Just real briefly, how, how does the process work to become a Harrisburg firefighter? Sure. So um, the uh, the civil service test, um, it, you know, it's publicly uh, announced when that will occur. Uh, you know, so we'll have that on the website on, on the city's website. Um, it'll be uh, you know obviously in the newspaper, uh, and we're also going to use social media, the, the city's uh, uh, Facebook page, things like that, to put the word out uh, when that application period opens. Um, it will be sometime mid next year. I'm, I'm not sure of the exact date yet. Um, so once you get that application, um, you, you fill that out, you return it to um, uh, human resources. And once we have a test, um, there's a written test um, that, uh, and when I say written test, it, it's a written test in the sense that you have to put your answers on the paper, but the test is all based on video. So there's no, uh, you know, there's no test booklet that, that you're reading from. Everything is on the video screen for you. Uh, and it, uh, it goes through scenarios, uh, and, and you just select the best answers based upon um, what you're seeing happen in a video. So uh, we switched to that test. It's been a very, very positive um, test for us. And uh, once that test comes back, uh, everybody is ranked based upon their score um, uh, and, uh, you know, on a civil service listing. Uh, and then from there, that's how we start to uh, bring folks in to do the physical agility test, uh, which we run uh, in conjunction with uh, Lancaster, York, and uh, Reading, and uh, Mannheim Township, and several other, other, other career departments. Uh, we run that, you pass a physical agility test, and uh, we bring you in for an interview, um, do an interview uh, with, uh, with HR and, and uh, the fire chiefs. And then we give conditional job offers. Uh, once that conditional job offer is given, two more steps is a psychological exam and then also a physical exam. And we want to make sure that you're physically fit. Uh, and it, it also uh, gives us a baseline uh, going forward of what your, what your health is. Um, that way we can see if there's any uh, issues um, that are work-related uh, you know, throughout your career so that we can, so when you're at, at the end, uh, when you get to that 20 or 25 years, when you retire, um, you're still a, a healthy uh, functioning adult. Uh, and and that, that's what we're looking for uh, in, in the health exam. Um, and then uh, we go off to the fire academy, uh, 12 weeks. You, you learn uh, 
every, you learn everything. We start with the basics. Um, what, what, a what a fire hose is, what a fire nozzle is. Uh, and then we go through the advanced stuff. Uh, when we look at the, the EMT, the emergency medical technician portion of it on how to treat patients that we run into on a daily basis, you know, how to, how to uh, perform CPR and, uh, how to splint a, uh, a broken leg or, a, uh, you know, take care of a patient that's having a seizure. Uh, and uh, upon uh, graduation, we put you through another couple of weeks of uh, programming here in the city with uh, learning how to do uh, confined space rescues and, and uh, water rescues going out on a boat and swimming in the river uh, and, and uh, being able to help, uh, you know, folks like that. And, uh, and after we're finished with that uh, portion, you are uh, given to a platoon. Uh, so you're assigned a, a, a platoon on the, on the street, and that's when you start the fun job. That's when the four-day work week starts. So two daylights, uh, and then two night turns, and then you're off for four days. And uh, that, that's that's when the real career starts, and uh, that, that's when you get to interact with the public and uh, and, and be out there on a daily basis helping the uh, the citizens of our city and uh, throughout the region. Well, thanks for that. And uh, if you're watching at home and that type of career uh, uh, may appeal to you, I, I, I hope you'll uh, you'll consider testing to become a Harrisburg uh, firefighter. We'll let people know when the next uh, round of testing is. Again, we expect to do that next year at some point. Is that right, Chief? Yes, correct. Uh, I believe that we're probably going to, it'll probably be sometime in August uh, is when that test will be administered. Okay. okay, and that's the first step. Uh, not too intimidating. Doesn't require uh, any uh, any great background. Just uh, just trying to get a general aptitude for uh, for whether you'd be a good fit for the job. And you can uh, watch the videos, answer the questions, and then take it from there. So, so thanks for that. Thanks for the uh, safety tips, the health and safety tips. We've gotten a lot of information today. Moment. Um, perhaps uh, the viewers uh, may have a, a question for the fire chief and myself. Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, we'll start with a comment. From uh, Victor, we, we want to thank uh, Victor for his comment. Uh, he, he was uh, mentioning about the diversity in the fire department. And he says, a lot of children in the African-American community grow up with aspirations to become firefighters. Uh, he presents an idea, I think, if you start working with the youth in the inner city schools, uh, that can also pique their interest. Um, so he's very interested in, in seeing that diversity in that uh, and progress with that. Um, uh, other than that, uh, we have a question about uh, space heaters. What is the proper way to dispose of an old space heater? Hmm. Pro uh, proper way to dispose of a space heater would just be uh, in your normal uh, garbage. Uh, you can put it out with uh, the, the normal trash. Okay. All right. And then uh, next question we have here is... Um, about the smoke detectors. And I can, before I ask this question, let me personally attest that I also am a recipient of uh, smoke detectors. Uh, several years ago, I contacted the fire department and there's a firefighter that came out um, very soon after my request and, um, you know, toured my home. I was in an apartment at that time, walked around and uh, answered all my questions uh, that I had. And I was surprised about the locations mm -hmm. that the smoke detectors were installed. So where I was thinking, okay, yeah, this might be a good location. Um, obviously, uh, you know, I left it to the experts and uh, he explained to me why uh, he, he installed it in, in certain locations. So that leads me to this question about um, how many smoke detectors should there be in a house or an apartment? So, uh, excellent question. Um, and there, there really is no, um, I, I can't say each house should have X number of smoke alarms. What I can tell you is, um, every floor of the, uh, every floor of the house, including the basement should have one smoke alarm and an inside of every bedroom should have a smoke alarm. Uh, and, and the reason for that, when we look at the, when we look at some of our larger homes, um, that one on the, on the, say on the second floor of a building where most people sleep, um, may not, you may not hear that in your bedroom behind a closed door. You know, we encourage you to sleep with that door closed. And so, uh, we encourage, uh, and, and require that, that smoke alarm to be inside of the bedroom as well. So we have one in the bedroom that will alert you, wake you up. Um, so, uh, a typical house, let, let's just walk through a, a, a typical, um, three-story row home in the city of Harrisburg. So if it's a three-story row home, uh, we also have a basement. So that's four smoke alarms. And typically, there's two bedrooms on the second floor and one or two bedrooms on the third floor. So that would be an additional two to three smoke alarms um, that we would also need to include 
um, by adding that smoke alarm inside of that bedroom. And again, they're all free of charge. So there, there's no, uh, you know, there's no charge. It's not like you got to go out and spend $30 a piece on these. Um, the fire department will come out and we try to come out within 48 hours of that phone call. Mm-hmm. And they would, and they be, would be expensive to have to purchase on your own. So uh, we're fortunate to be able to offer this service, and people should take advantage of it. Even if you even if you have half of that number and you you want to get some advice on where the others should go, um, uh, call the fire department and they'll come out and make sure that your house is safe, and they will provide the smoke detectors free of charge. Just to end on this, uh, as far as the number that was mentioned, seven one seven two five five six four six four to uh, install the smoke alarms, and uh, those are free of charge, and uh, you can also just dial 311 and we'll forward you uh, to the fire department. That's great. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mo, and thanks, Chief. Uh, Lots of great advice today. Thank you all for watching at home, and in the spirit of today's uh, show, I hope everybody stays uh, safe and healthy, and I hope we'll see you Thursday night at one of the fire stations from 5 to 7. Wear a mask. Wear a very, very scary mask. Uh, We'll be there, and we look forward to grab and go treat night. Until next week, I'm Mayor Eric Papenfuss saying stay safe and be well.